So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to our In Conversation series brought to you by the Royal Society of Medicine. Now, April the 2nd was uh, the start of our regular webinar series, COVID-19, for health professions by health professions. Now, about to have its 55th episode. And so now from the RSM, we will always celebrate April the 2nd, and we will call it Rachel's Day, because our very first guest that day was Dr. Rachel Clark, or Dr. Oxford, as she's known to our 140, her 140,000 Twitter followers. So I'm therefore delighted to say that Rachel has now come back again. We didn't, obviously didn't put her off. She in fact achieved the highest scores we've ever had for a, for a webinar right at the start on our first day. We've been trying to catch up ever since. And she's come back now for our longer in conversation series where we can explore a little bit more, not just about the matters we were talking about back in April, gosh, how long ago that was, but also a bit about herself. And also we can have a bit more questions than we normally get through in the rather faster format. So Rachel came to national prominence during the junior doctor's dispute, which does also seem an incredibly long time ago, almost a kind of halcyon time when we were talking about protecting doctors' pay and hours before we started talking about protecting their lives. She's written her first book, Your Life in Their Hands, in My Hands, Your Life in My Hands, sorry, her time as a junior doc, and her second book we were talking about then, Dear Life, about dying. She's now a specialist in palliative care, making dying her day job. And now she has her third book about to come out, here it is, called Breathtaking. You do really have an eye for um, catchy titles, Rachel. I'm very, very impressed. So in order to justify your existence here, tell us about your new book. When's it out, by the way? Hi, Simon. Thank Hi you. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's coming out at, right at the end of January next year, January the 28th. So not that long ago now. And basically, it's, um, it's a... It's a snapshot of the first wave of COVID really. I, I started writing as everything kicked off. Um, I think mainly because as we got closer and closer to that first lockdown being imposed, I was getting more and more anxious like so many healthcare professionals. And when I get anxious, I don't sleep. So I would spend a lot of time um, pacing the kitchen up and down, drinking my cups of tea and, and bashing away on my laptop because that's that's what I do. So it didn't start out as a book uh, at all. But as things developed, um, it, it, it was kind of a compulsion to write. And gradually, as the weeks and months went by, that coalesced into me feeling really from within this... Um, this absolute necessity to commit the experience to paper or to a keyboard because um, that this was a story I, I, I had to tell and I wanted people to know about. So one of the defining features I think of this pandemic has been this extraordinary public narrative about what's happening. So people on podiums talking on behalf of patients or relatives or frontline healthcare professionals, and that not necessarily matching the lived experience of any of those individuals. And I knew that I could never write anything definitive or um, authoritative. That's going to take years and years to come out, but I could say, this is what it feels like for this NHS doctor. And here is my glimpse inside the NHS. And it seemed valuable to try and document that real time so that there was something recorded about that lived and felt experience of the pandemic. Okay, well, we're gonna come back to that, but as I say, but let's, let's... That's the introduction to the book, but let, let's have an introduction to you. Now, you said that, um, the words you just said, you said you were writing at your laptop because that's what I do. Well, that's certainly what you did because you have a great advantage on the rest of us poor doctors because you started out as a journalist and therefore you know how to write. Most of us never learned that skill, but you had it from the start. So tell us a bit about that then. How, how come you ended up in the, in the kind of uh, grub street of journalism? <laughs> well, um, 
When I was seven years old, we had to write a book at junior school called All About Me. And you did a drawing of yourself and your mom and your dad. And you had to write a page about what I would be when I grew up. And I drew a picture of myself writing at a desk and said, I will be a writer. I will write storybooks when I grow up. Um, so I obviously, from a very young age, loved stories. And I did. I used to write books for my brother and sister that they were not the slightest bit interested in and they were <laughs> upon them. I wish they kept them now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, my family still items. didn't like to read what I write. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, then as I got older, as I, when I became a teenager, I used to love discussing current affairs with my parents, my dad especially, and I started to realise that words were powerful. They were really powerful. And um, a really um, formative experience for me was learning as a teenager about the democracy um, demonstrations in China in Tiananmen Square. And I suddenly understood that the only reason I cared about the lack of democracy in this country on the other side of the world was because journalists were writing about it and they were telling me about it. And that was a kind of light bulb moment where I saw stories not as just wonderful things to keep me awake under the duvet at night, but things that could change the world. So I was a very idealistic um, young adult student who sort of thought that I could change the world through words. I'm not sure that you've lost that idealism at all, actually, to be honest. But what was your first job in journalism? My first ever job was as a baby researcher on a program called the Jonathan Dimbleby program. And he is the, um, he probably wouldn't like me saying this, but the less famous of that, those Dimbleby <laughs> brothers, <laughs> not the one who did the BBC elections, but he used to interview a politician um, every Sunday for an hour in front of a live audience. And I was a little researcher on his program. And that was really incredible because we in in the run up to the um the election um in which tony blair became prime minister we interviewed john major tony blair all all the um the key figures and you know it felt as though preparing for those interviews and researching them genuinely i'm told that you um you put john major into urinary urinary retention is that true <laughs> yes I did, I did. Um, he was very late for his interview and my job as a baby researcher was to meet and greet him and escort him to the studio. And the programme went out live at one o'clock come what may. So if he wasn't there, there'd just be an empty chair next to Jonathan Dimbleby. So he got stuck in traffic. There was some kind of demonstration in London and it was, it was about two minutes to one when the, the car finally <laughs> arrived. And he, um, and he got out looking really cross and looked at me and I said, oh, come, come this way, Prime Minister. And he said, do you, have, do you have a water closet? And I was very anxious because I was worried I might take him into a, a, a dead end or I'd, I'd get lost en route to the backstage. And I looked at him, I thought, I have no idea what you're asking me. I don't know what a water closet is. What are you asking me? So I just looked at him and said, no, Prime Minister, I'm afraid we don't. <laughs> and took him onto the stage where he had to sit for an hour with his bursting bladder. <laughs> yeah. poor, poor chap, poor That's chap. Awesome. Did you apologise? Well, no, there was no opportunity. No. And it got worse, Simon, because then afterwards, my job was to escort him to the green room where he could sort of have a little glass of white wine with Jonathan Dimbleby. And then <laughs> as I entered the room, I turned round to say to him, oh, we're here, Prime Minister. But I sort of stopped as I did that and he carried on walking. So I, in a, he's very tall, he's, he's more than six foot and I'm very short. And so I managed to inadvertently then headbutt the Prime Minister and his two secret agents sort of surged <laughs> towards me as though I was a terrorist threat. And then I did apologize, um, yeah. Poor man, poor man. But you did some other things as well. I mean, you became a foreign correspondent, I think. Kind of. I mean, I, I worked in uh, television documentaries and mm -hmm. I, I wasn't um, a war correspondent or anything like that at all. But, uh, but I accidentally ended up in some 
um, difficult situation. So I, I, I did quite a lot of foreign films about things like the rise of Al Qaeda and um, m most memorably, I, I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo mm. for six weeks at the height of the civil war in the 1990s, which was in incredibly um, dangerous. And I had to kind of go on a, a, um, a hostile environment training course where you were taught by ex-SAS soldiers how to survive in in war zones, essentially, which it basically was. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that was pre pretty pretty tough, although I think the hardest thing was going into a Médecins Sans Frontières hospital and, and literally seeing children who'd had their limbs macheted by the competing militias. It was pretty harrowing stuff. Mm. And and how and, and how long did you? I, I can't remember now. How long did you stay in, in, in? That was with the BBC. So how long did you stay with the Beeb? Uh, it was mainly Channel Four. Channel Four, sorry. I I was in TV in total for nearly a decade. Right. Lots of it um, as a as a freelance, sort of working for companies that would make programs for for different channels. Sometimes BBC, sometimes Channel Four, um, and but all that time. I had this little nagging voice of, I made a mistake, should have done medicine. Right, and now your, your father was uh, an Oxford surgeon, I believe. He was um, an anaesthetist initially, oh. and he I've was- done my research, have I? <laughs> yeah, that's quite all right, you know. <laughs> this, has been a, this has been a busy year. <laughs> yeah, true, yeah. <laughs> um, he, yeah, so he was in the Navy. He was a naval anaesthetist on, on ships at sea, and then, he eventually sort of settled down, had a family and became a, a, a GP and was a, a kind of much loved sort of old school um, local GP who... Right. All his so families. if Roger Kirby is, is watching, much, much better than a surgeon, clearly. Uh, we would <laughs> certainly agree with that. Okay, and is that... And so that, that thought of doing medicine had always... Had it always been in your mind or... or, or Yes, I, I loved from as young as I can remember, I loved talking to dad about his stories, his patients, what he used to do as a doctor, how you put somebody to sleep as an anaesthetist, how the body worked, why was blood red and not blue, you know, I, I just found all of that endlessly fascinating. And I, I liked science, and I loved the idea of being a doctor. But it's really hard when you're at school trying to figure out what, how, how are you going to spend the rest of your life? And I was afraid that perhaps I really wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to make dad proud of me. I wanted to follow in his footsteps, reasons that were not sincere in a way. Um, and I also had this competing love of words and writing and literature. And I ended up pursuing that. Um, because it seemed to be the thing that I found most fulfilling, but just nagging away, I never stopped. I never stopped being fascinated by medicine, talking to my dad about it. And um, as I grew older in my twenties, increasingly, I just had this nagging sense that I, I had made a mistake and I'd never know it unless I tried it out. And what have you got to lose? True. Well, I think you just answered Olivia Sorden's question, which was, uh, why did you want to be a doctor? So you've given a pretty good, good answer to that. And you've also shown why you are every politician's nightmare. You're a much loved doctor, but you're also a bloody good journalist. So I, I can see why you are really their nightmare. Now, it's interesting on your books. So let's see how good you are on this. But um, do you know the word that is most commonly used to apply in your reviews? I had a look at some of them today. And uh, there's a particular word that describes your books very often. Do you know, or you or your books? Do you know, could you, any idea what that might be? No. Oh, it's unflinching, unflinching. So uh, see which one this one is then. So the unflinching detail of Rachel, of Rachel Clark's book, which book was that? Probably any of them, <laughs> I don't know. I think that, that might that be your life. Yeah, no, it was your life in their hands, okay. Unflinching Insider's Account of Medicine in the Time of COVID. That's easy. Well, that must be the latest one. <laughs> yes, that's breathtaking. Okay. Um, has a merciless gaze, a deep affection for people that allows that gaze to become unflinching. 
the first one? No, that's Alan Aitborn. That's not you. It's a <laughs> Alan but no, honestly, you, 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 unflinching does seem to be your, 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 uh, your particular word. Do you think that's fair? I mean, do you flinch? No, I get very, very scared indeed, uh, often. But I think that when you're really scared, it's probably because it matters and you just have to try and do your best. So an example in my uh, early medical training of being unflinching was um, I had a, a great fear that um, I wouldn't be able to handle acute and emergency medicine. And if I made a mistake, if I was inept, incompetent, someone could die because I wasn't able to do the job properly. So instead of kind of choosing uh, rotations in my foundation years that would get me away from that, I deliberately, the only thing that mattered to me was I had to do an A&E rotation as a foundation doctor because I had to confront this and I had to master it and I would keep on doing A&E until I could do it. Uh, and I think when there's a really difficult conversation to be had or a daunting situation to navigate, um, I want to step up and try and do the best job I can. So with a lot of fear, but I guess, yeah, doing there's, it nevertheless. I mean, there's debates that go on in, in medicine as to whether or not we should show fear or at least show emotion. Certainly in, in my trade, there's a big thing about should, uh, should we reveal emotions, even cry with our patients? Um, or alternatively, should we not do that? You know, should we definitely be unflinching? Where are you? Not, not, not so much in your own practice, but on that particular, it's quite a debate and, and got quite heated, particularly in psychiatry. Where would you be on that scale? And you deal with incredibly distressed, I mean, the most distressed, terrible situations. Yeah, so I think that issue is, is one of the defining fundamental issues at the heart of medicine and yeah. how to be a good doctor. Um, and I think the most important thing is to acknowledge how incredibly difficult it is to walk that line between um, open kind of warm-hearted empathy are our natural human responses to emotional situations versus um, maintaining distance and objectivity um, in order to be a capable of doing a good job as a doctor whether that is slicing through someone's brain or telling them they're going to die in the next 24 hours or and this is just as important um, managing the job of um, inspiring trust and confidence and hope in patients and their families because if your patient is not able to feel safe with you then I don't think you're doing your job as a doctor equally if your patient thinks you're a, a, a heartless individual who cannot remotely understand what they're going through you are fundamentally failing but navigating the gray area between those two extremes is spectacularly difficult. And I, it, it's my personal belief that uh, many doctors, nurses, every kind of healthcare professional um, suffers, burns out um, incredibly because of the difficulties of navigating that. And, and I guess if I could wave a magic wand and change one thing about medical education, medical school, it would be to build in as a core part of medical education the fact that that is incredibly difficult and finding your point on that continuum is something I think you can only learn how to do, you can only experience it, you build your, your path to that point, but it's inordinately difficult. That's just a brilliant answer, actually, Rachel. I think we should just bottle that answer and put it on a loop and just <laughs> show it continuously on our YouTube channel or medical. I mean, I know genuinely, I thought that was, a, that was uh, absolutely stunning. And you've completely thrown me now because I can't remember what I was, where I was going with this. Uh, but OK, so let's, let's uh, take another question now. Um, I've actually slipped up now 
in my Zooms as, as we do. Uh, Richard Annaldale, I think he's one of our regulars, but uh, he is asking you, ah, here we are. He said, without, um, so without giving away key parts of your new book, but you can do that anyway. And, and uh, yes, this is, this is about end of life care and, uh, and how it has changed. And in fact, I do remember when you came on, on that first episode we did on Rachel's Day, as we call it, um, you, you said this, and I quote you now, this is the, the coronavirus spreads through the British population. That's the one fact we agree on. Whether we like it or not, society's greatest taboo, death and dying, has been thrust unequivocally on the stage. You really are a pro when you write. And you said that the pandemic would change this. Do you think you were right? Yeah. I do. I, I feel as though collectively as a society, whether we like it or not, we have inhabited in 2020 a world where death has been a defining feature. Every single day we find out how many Britons have died of this virus. We learn how many people may be dying from their undiagnosed cancers because of mm. this virus. We learn that in the early days, some doctors, we believe, imposed blanket do not attempt CPR orders on entire populations in care homes. And we have to wrestle with all the fears that that understandably throws up. So it has been in your face in the most profound sense. And I think uh, that has been sh shattering really for, uh, for, for, for some people. Um, even for me as a palliative care doctor, I, I, I was used in February, 2020 to inhabiting a world where death was my job. And then I came home into another world where death was on the periphery and I operated, I existed in a world of life and light. I don't know that there's been much of a, a, a light uh, live world this year. We, the, the, the fear of the, the threat of this virus has just been hanging there in the air all around us all the time. And the excitement and hope and joy that has erupted this week with the advent of the uh, first vaccinations against COVID, I think is, is a direct consequence of how much we have been oppressed this year by the shadow of death, to, to, to not coin a phrase. Um, and I think that's been incredibly difficult, probably for, for, for most of us, all of us probably. Um, it, it was always my hope even from the early days that good may come from this, this that it wouldn't just be oppressive, that we would learn from this experience. Mm. And I think we have learned an enormous amount about uh, how people die, what matters when people die, value on a human life, all those kinds of big issues that perhaps we normally try and ignore as we go through day-to-day -day life. But yeah, but, it's been but Far from being as you might say, a good time to die. It's been a terrible time to die, hasn't it? All the things that we learned about good palliative care, all the things that you had practiced seem to have vanished almost. I mean, there's never been a worse time to die. I think that in the very early days of the pandemic, when we were catapulting towards uh, the plight that patients in Lombardy and Northern Italy were facing, that, that is undeniably the case. So if you think back to the second half of March and the first two weeks of April, the NHS was on the brink. So everybody was scrambling to increase ICU capacity, intensive care beds. Um, but we were on the absolute edge of managing to achieve that. And we know that in London at that time, hospitals, some hospitals were having to ferry their ICU patients to other hospitals because they were completely full. And by full, that wasn't just their 
regular adult ICUs, that was also the ad hoc makeshift ICU beds in recovery bays and pediatric ICUs. There were, you know, offices that turned into primitive ad hoc ICU beds. Um, and it's undeniably the case that in those early days, it was shocking. It was very much battlefield conditions. People were rushed into hospital. They often died very quickly. They did not have their families present. And this was a completely new disease. And we were learning as we went. We didn't know anything about this disease when it began. Um, but I think one of the most remarkable things about this year is how very, very quickly the NHS learned and recognised what was horrific and what needed to change. So, for example, um, it was immediately apparent that one of the most heartbreaking things about this disease was the way in which it wrenched patients from their loved ones and the necessary infection control measures meant that a patient at the one point when they really needed their loved ones at the point of approaching the end of their life they were severed from them um, and so we had to provide the humanity and we had to try and be there we could never replace a family or loved one but we could do our absolute best to ensure that a patient did not die completely alone and it is it will always, as long as I live for the rest of my life, it will be a constant source of wonder to me how my NHS colleagues managed to do that, how hard they tried to endeavour to ensure that patients knew they were not alone at the point of death. And, and um, it is astonishing how brilliantly ICU nurses and doctors and ward nurses and doctors and, and everybody present did their utmost to ensure that people did not die in, in horrific, isolated, lonely circumstances. And medical students as well, I think. Absolutely. So um, in, in, in my hospital, for instance, so, so I, I work in Oxford, um, we've got a big medical school and very quickly um, the uh, the the the, um, the hospital realised that they were going to need just just people to help with the numbers we were going to face, and they asked all of initially all of the final year medical students, um, would you like to um, step up early and effectively become baby doctors early? And um, of course, the students didn't for a, I don't think for a moment hesitated. All of the students I've talked to immediately said yes we want to do whatever we can and suddenly there were students thrust into unimaginably difficult situations so um, one of the students that I've interviewed in my book um, an, an, an extraordinary woman called Sana found herself working as a family liaison person in ICU so she was the bridge between these poor, poor patients intubated in ICU and their families outside unable to visit because you only earned a visit if your loved one was felt to be actively dying. And she had never experienced anything really of death and dying at that point, but she was having those conversations and being that human bridge between the, the world inside and outside the hospital. And you know, students who were in their early 20s, who were nothing in their training had prepared them for this. They just stepped up in their thousands up and down the country in an astonishing way. And of course, so did thousands and thousands of retired NHS staff. And in a sense, that was even more remarkable because they knew they were exactly the age group that put the most at risk of dying from COVID. And they stepped up anyway. What, what an incredible thing. Indeed, there's a, a really poignant passage you talk about the car park at the JR that I remember well, full of people just sitting there staring at the windows of the wards. Has that stopped? Yeah, um, I mean, that that was really awful. Um, the, these were family members who had a patient, a, a loved one inside the hospital, couldn't visit, maybe 
their loved one had COVID, but you only earned a visit if we felt that somebody was very close to the end of life. And so they were so desperate to be close, physically close to their relative that they just would sit in their cars facing the hospital. And, and I think I found that one of the most heartbreaking sites really in the whole of this year because of everything it symbolized um that there's this um there's this concept in neuroscience of skin hunger um the, the, this um this biological need for touch and the malign effects if we're not able to, to touch each other and i used to think about that and think that you know this this hunger people are insatiable to be hugging, holding there physically at the bedside. We're tactile, we're mammals, we're creatures with warm blood and yet to be separated from someone you love when they're so desperately unwell, that goes, that violates everything about our, our nature as human beings. Um, so it was pretty awful and it's very different now because we're trying to, um, run as much of the normal hospital as we can while simultaneously caring for COVID patients. So the, the car parks are, are getting busy again. You know, you might even struggle to find a space because all of this normal activity, elective activity is happening at the same time as caring for COVID. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, and and we'll, we'll move on a little in, in a moment, but there's also quite a few people asking questions on that. But I want to bring you back to your book. We've, um, ever since we had Mary Beard on a couple of weeks ago, we've gone all classical. And uh, you seem to have got the bug as well because um, my, my attempt to speak, to, to do a Latin quote with her failed dismally. Let's go to the Greek, because you talk about apocalypsis, the Greek concept in your new book, but not in the way that we normally use it, apocalyptic. You, you, you quite correctly, I think, uh, translate it as being something slightly different. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that and, and where you where you take that? Yeah, so so if you if you go back to the Greek roots of that word, um, it, it contrary to, to what I used to believe, it, do, it doesn't mean a catastrophe or sort of everything falling apart. It's it's an unveiling, so a, a revelation. A revelation. So and, and I loved that that dual meaning, the sort of classical roots and then the modern contemporary meaning of that word, because it seems to me as though um, or, or always in, in general, in times of great momentous upheaval of, of, of any kind, whether it's a society, an epoch or, or perhaps even individual upheaval in an individual's life, those are the moments when we have the potential to really learn. And if you look at um, recent historical upheavals, if you look at the Second World War or, or the First World War, for example, you have antibiotics coming from, from that great upheaval. And it seemed to me as though likewise in COVID, even in the early days, no one knew how this was going to end. But the one thing you could predict was that we were going to learn in 2020 because you have to, when everything you know and understand is falling apart around you, you have to learn how to get through these cataclysmic uh, conditions. And sure enough, re remarkably, you know, uh, even before Boris Johnson and the government imposed lockdown back on the 23rd of March, even before then, the Oxford recovery trial, which is the huge randomized, um, uh, well, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but a multi-platform trial where um, various different treatments for COVID are being tested. Um, they started recruiting their first patients before we even had lockdown in the UK. And now um, it's well over 20,000 patients that have been recruited. I I'm embarrassed now. I don't know the exact number now, <laughs> but that's a, but that's an incredible example of innovation that stemmed from absolute necessity. Here we are this week where the first COVID vaccine has been licensed for use in the UK and has indeed been given already to thousands of vulnerable people in the UK. Vaccines normally take about a decade to go from bench to, to arm. And that is remarkable. Um, 
And I think for me, this year has been revelatory um, in the Greek sense, in part because of what how quickly we've had to learn about this virus, but, but more fundamentally, actually, I think that it has forced all of us to really question what matters to us as human beings, what is actually important. Um, and I think if there's one thing I've learned this year as, as a doctor and as a human being, it's that there are very few things that really matter. There are very few things that are essential and important in our lives. But those things we need to fight for tooth and nail. Indeed. Now, Sue Newsom has just taken me to task quite correctly for not pointing out that plenty of third year nurses also stepped up the plate during their training in exactly yes. the same way. So we should definitely acknowledge that. And I was about to take a, a question from Trish Lewis, but it just says, hi, Rachel. So Trish hi, Trish. Ah, oh, OK. <laughs> OK. Now, so uh, let's get on to a different type of conversation. So you talk a lot about end of life conversations, but there are other conversations as well that go on. And, and these are in the world of social media. And uh, at the start of the epidemic, and uh, I have the quotes if you want them, quite a lot of people were saying that one of the other things that might come out of the pandemic was that we'd got more serious, perhaps more collegiate, and even the internet seemed to be, I uh, quote, growing up, becoming more adult, kinder and gentler. I'm not quite sure why growing up makes you more adult. Anyway, becoming kinder and more gentle. Do you think that's happened? Ha. Huh. Well, um, without using the precise uh, language, um, tonight, because I think it's probably not suitable for the RSM, I can give you a flavour of the kind of um, messages I am now routinely sent on social media. I receive death threats, I receive rape threats, I receive every manner of swearing, abusive language that I'm not going to repeat. Um, I'm accused of being um, a fascist, Joseph Mengele, um, you name it, the abuse is out there. And all of this, all of what I've just described is for two reasons alone. One, that I believe COVID is a real disease. And two, that I think vaccinations can save lives. And just to add a little bit of detail into that mix. Yeah, I do. So I regularly, pretty much now get abuse for being an NHS doctor. So it is entirely possible now on Twitter, which is the, 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 the platform where I tend to be most active, to receive all of those kinds of abuse. And interestingly, there's always a, a strong misogynistic um, element to this abuse from people who cannot tolerate the fact that you try to, insist calmly but assertively that COVID is real, that it has killed over 75,000 people in Britain to date, that it's a serious disease and that vaccines may help. Literally, that's what you receive death threats and rape threat threats for in 2020. And I, I, I was somebody who was used to toxicity on social media you you um you know the, the whole all of the the brexit debates were were, were not pretty sometimes <laughs> but boy has it gone into a new realm of of unpleasantness these days so i think the answer to my question is clearly no <laughs> yeah yeah i'm just can i don't why i mean if your husband dave was here he would be saying i'm sure he'd be saying why do you look at that rachel I don't look at it. Um, I always, I, I block anybody who is abusive like that. Um, I, I, I wouldn't tolerate that in real life. I wouldn't, and I don't tolerate that online either. Um, but the reason I don't shut it out completely, so I could kind of reconfigure my social media accounts so I never saw any of that at all. Mm. But if I did so, I also would never see or be able to interact with any of the thousands and thousands of other people 
that are also out there on the internet and are communicating in a constructive way. And I am not willing to allow some abusive, misogynistic, foul Twitter trolls to police and shut down the incredibly positive interactions that you can have on social media. Um, so I'll, I'll block them. Usually I'll report them to Twitter. Sometimes they get, you know, shut down for 24 hours. Um, come and back. <laughs> have a thick skin and, and accept the fact that you can't actually operate in this sphere without receiving that abuse. It, it, mm. it doesn't mean it's pleasurable. It's absolutely horrible. But um, I don't believe in censorship. I think that um, we should inhabit a society where anything that is not inflammatory and abusive should be um, sayable. And I'm not going to stop saying things because of a few trolls who are probably sitting in their grubby pants with a can of beer behind their internet doing who knows what as they type their vitriol. Indeed. But you anticipated this before this happened. You were writing the mirror about um about, and in fact, you specifically quoted research to say a lot of the anti-vax stuff was coming out of Russia, you said by bots and trolls, uh, designed to spread misinformation and, and kind of rent the social fabric. Um, slightly ironic that Russia is now pushing a vaccine and of course hasn't handled its own COVID crisis very well. Do you think that that will change things at all? That maybe those bots will stop? I've no idea myself. I just wonder if you, yeah. if you did write about it. I think, that genie is well and truly out of the yeah. can. And um, if you, you know, if your objective is to destabilize a society or a particular government, then an incredibly effective way of, of so doing is to um, not assert your version of reality as true, but much more seductively and cleverly to start to, um, ensure the population feels as though they, they there's no such thing as truth they can't distinguish anymore between truth and lies that's i think the really disturbing and fundamentally undermining um problem with social media and actually if you if you look at that in terms of of, of this week and the news this week about vaccines so mm -hmm. all week i've been having conversations face to face with people who are sensible people who maybe are my colleagues in the NHS or, or people I know personally who are saying what do you reckon about the vaccine Rach what do you think about it and they're asking because they're genuinely worried that this vaccine may not be safe and I explain why I am going to have it as soon as anybody's willing to give it to me and I and I explain mm -hmm. why I'm so delighted to have it and why I think it's safe but I think it's very significant that um that degree of fear around the COVID vaccines is out there. It's, it's clearly prevalent and that must be because what happens online doesn't stay online. It filters through into, into real yeah. lives and fears. No, I'm sure that's right. Now, Asta Phillips is taking us out of the hospital and pointing out as David Spiegelhart did very beautifully when, when, when he was on, on, on the program um, that one of the things that's changed this year has been a lot more people are dying at home than were this time last year. And uh, we asked David, was this a good or a bad thing? Was this a failure of care or is this actually better for people? So can I ask you the same question? Are you, do you regard this as something we should be concerned about or something we should be pleased about? Or maybe we just don't know. For me, um, I would slightly rephrase that question because I think the-, the do. <laughs> Not in a, not in a- devious <laughs> avoiding the question way but just because I, th I think it's not the right question um I'm sure you're right <laughs> I, I think the, the the really important question is are people dying in the place of their choosing and in right. the manner of their choosing so for me that's the fundamental question so so if more people are dying at home because a more people wish to die at home and b they are dying at home in the way that as closely as possible approximates to, to the kind of ending of their life that they hoped for, then it's a good thing. 
Um, but we know that that's not necessarily the case for, for a proportion, I don't know what proportion, but certainly a proportion of the people who have died this year, we, we know that um, there have been um, people, for instance, who have died of, of COVID at home who have never received medical attention other than speaking to 111 and getting advice and then deteriorating rapidly and actually then being found after the virus has claimed their life, for instance. I, I'm, mm. I'm not sure any of us could say that that is a good, a good thing. Um, I, I think in general, we, we know that when you ask people, um, when you survey the population and ask them where they'd like to, to die, the majority of people, about two thirds of people say they would like to die at home, yep. um, but only a very small minority of, of people, about 20% do, and then the majority die in hospital or care homes. And um, it's my own belief, um, and to some extent, I think this is backed up by the evidence, um, that in part, that is fundamentally because of nothing more um, difficult to understand or arcane than resources. If we had properly resourced community end of life care, so we had the district nurses, the carers, the palliative care teams, all of whom could go in and create a safe environment within which people could spend their final days, weeks in the company of their loved ones, I suspect many more people would die at home but actually what happens all too frequently is there is a crisis at home in the community and a patient bounces into maybe a hospice or more frequently a hospital because the resources just aren't there and um, I think in a civilized society that is absolutely catastrophically wrong we wouldn't allow mothers to give birth at home with the inevitable increased infant and maternal mortality rate that would entail because of lack of resources. So how is it that we don't pull out all the stops to ensure people can die in a place of their own choosing? And we don't, palliative care and, and district nursing and all community services are woefully underfunded. And, and I think that yeah. that is, uh, uh, for me, it's a source of deep shame that we're a rich country that allows that to happen. Fair enough. Uh, ironically, that little noise is my my laptop telling me that my virus protection has expired. Um, <laughs> it's just done it again as well. Um, so I don't quite know what that's telling me about life. But uh, you do have that wonderful quote from Edward, actually. You say, what is it, that um, a virus is a, a piece of malice in, in, in wrapped up in a protein. I think, uh, I don't know where you found that in his work, but uh, you did. It's a quite good description of it. Okay, so and just one more, a couple more on, on from from the audience on on palliative care. Now, it's a question that that actually has seems rather obvious. Michaela Draining, uh, Brailing, I think, uh, is talking about you know we're all going on to telemedicine, Zoom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're having this conversation on Zoom. I'd rather we were live, but we're not. But then she says, um, "Is this is this something that's going to come to palliative care as well? And if so, is that a good idea?" Well. Two years ago, there was a horrific example of precisely this, a real life example, and it, and it, it ironically went viral. Um, it, it spread across um, the world's news because it was so horrific. So in a, um, a hospital in California, a man, and he was called, uh, his first name was Ernesto, and I can't remember, uh, Ernesto Quintana, I think was his name. He had um, end-stage COPD, so a, 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 a chronic lung condition, and he had bounced in and out of hospital with um, very serious infections. And on this occasion, his medical team, on the basis of a scan, reached the conclusion that he was not going to survive this particular infection. However, instead of a doctor sitting down with Mr. Quintana and, and, and telling him this news, um, a robot did precisely that. So in this hospital, they had um, huge robots which were kind of wheeled in and on the top of the robot was a screen 
upon which you could see um, a physician who was, I don't know how many hundred miles away. And that, a disembodied doctor's face on a robot was the medium through which this particular patient was told, you're going to die. Um, and the family, uh, there was, I think this gentleman's granddaughter was there with her and she complained and the story went viral. And it was this iconic moment of utter inhumanity in medicine, this notion that it was acceptable for disembodied technology to tell a human being this momentous news, this is the end of your life, you are going to die. How could that possibly not be communicated through a, a flesh and blood human being? And I guess my horror at that story is my answer to that question. Um, I'll fight tooth and nail to ensure that that is not palliative care of the future because um, it is my absolute conviction that of all the things that count at the end of life, one of the most important is not the morphine, it's not the strong blood uh, drugs, it is a human presence there with you in your final days and hours. That's what makes all the difference. And I hadn't heard that, that, that story. That's quite stunning. Did it have any effect, the backlash? Has the, the robots been de-roboted? Ah, really well, um, I mean, the hospital was pretty defensive and said they had learned from uh, <laughs> this and would ensure it didn't happen again. Don't know if that means anything, but I, I imagine that hospitals in America would think twice about that particular way of breaking bad news in the future. You've got to hope so. You've got to hope so, haven't you? What an extraordinary story. Good yeah. Girl. Uh, well, once again, you've had me lost for words, but I shall try and recover, try and recover. Um, so the, the final point then, uh, well, we've got a couple of final points, but it's this. So I, just want, I also just want to get your views. You know, we live in a world of risk, of course. And just to what Chris Whitty said today to the Science and Technology Committee, talking about how we're going to titrate the risk downwards uh, with, as the vaccines, you know, spread, et cetera. And, uh, First, we'll stop people dying, we'll reduce that, then reduce emissions hustle. But he said, we will never get to zero risk, which I think is uh, a statement of, of, of the being obvious, really, but we won't. And he said, um, which leads to the question, what do you think is acceptable risk from COVID? In other words, at what point do we draw the line and say, OK, this new norm can now go we can, you know, we can resume life as it was or whatever it is. What is an acceptable risk in your view? How would we know? That's a really difficult question, Simon. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a risk averse person. I've done and sometimes do relatively dangerous things in my life. And I like the opportunity I like the freedom to choose to do that. And I think we all, you know, human beings, um, control is, is incredibly important to us. We like to be able to choose the direction our life takes. I guess for me, the answer to your question comes down to um, what, to what extent does the level of risk of being infected with and therefore potentially dying from COVID disadvantage particular groups in society? Because what strikes me about the current, uh, I want to say debate, but I think it's more of a furore. I mean, there's so much heat around this discussion about, you know, mm. are these restrictions acceptable or not? What really strikes me about um, some of the um, individuals, high profile individuals who argue very, very stridently that we must go back to life as normal, it's very easy to do that if you're a, a, a white, um, well-off, middle-class individual who can sit in a, a leafy suburb in Hampstead and communicate your views from your laptop. Um, Great, that's fantastic for you because the risks are relatively small for you. But if you are um, a, um, I don't know, um, um, a, 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 
um, a, a porter who goes to work in a hospital every day or a bus driver or a street sweeper and you your your job your means of survival economic survival entails you being put out there in a riskier situation then of course the risks are totally skewed for you and if you um, are not white if you come from um, an ethnic minority if you're elderly if you're overweight all these different groups in society then you are particularly vulnerable so um, I guess in an ideal world, the answer to that question wouldn't just be what is the level of risk that's acceptable, but also um, what is the spread of risk that's acceptable? Because what I'm damn sure about is it's not okay for a privileged elite to be pretty insulated from the risks of dying or being severely um, harmed by COVID, whereas the more vulnerable, less fortunate, less blessed uh, members of society are still significantly exposed. So it's not the quantity, it's also the equity and how do we ensure that our most vulnerable members are protected. Yes, we had that debate with Jonathan Sumption, I think, when he was uh, on as well. Um, he, I think, was on the other side of that argument, yes, although it's become a bit more nuanced since then, to be fair. Now then, um, let, let's kind of, um, I'm gonna give you the last word as well, but first of all, a couple of quick questions. Now, Trish, obviously your friend, she says, uh, what is next for you? Um, you know, you've been journalist, doctor, and she's a writer, and then she, she's, she's suggesting you for PM. Um, possibly there might be a vacancy, who knows? Well, one day there will be. Um, but what, what are you going to do next? Most of all, I like my day job. I like going to work. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> in the hospice and doing an ordinary day on the ward. That's what I really love. Um, I feel very lucky to be able to write as well and to have, uh, you know, to have a publisher and to have people want, want, want to read my books. I'm definitely going to carry on writing. I, 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 I love it. Um, but for me, it's all one and the same. It's all about patience. I can't really imagine ever writing about anything that isn't medical in some way. It's all about doing a decent job for patients if you possibly can. And I don't, I genuinely, I have, I have no big ambitions <laughs> at all in a what really fundamental way, except I definitely did, would never ever in a thousand million years go into politics. Ah, oh, okay. Um... You say you write as well. What you meant to say was you write well. I think that's actually <laughs> what you should have said. Sonia Zachariah says, why don't you do psychiatry? And I'm completely with her on that one. Um, now then, I've got to do a few quick announcements and then I will give you the last word. So quickly, just to round up for everyone else there, I need to remind them this is the season of goodwill and peace to all. So please do send your goodwill in some way, particularly a donation towards the Royal Society of Medicine um, uh, because we basically need it. And thanks also to, to all of you for your feedback. It's lovely to know that for some people, these conversations and webinars have been a beacon of light, as somebody said, in a dark night. Also, come and uh, eat and drink in our restaurant and our bar, because again, you'll find it very pleasant. It's now open till 11 p.m. and uh, I shall be there on Thursday. The president and myself will be there. And it is a tradition that the president, not the ex-president, will pick up the bar bill for everyone who is there. Don't leave it too long, though. <laughs> or by the time you start your meal in tier two, we might end up in tier three and then you will regret it. So next week, it's Martha Lane Fox, who's um, the daughter of the classicist Robin Lane Fox. As you can see, I'm still suffering from an excess of Mary Beard, uh, but she will be on talking to uh, Henrietta about her own really genuinely extraordinary life. And tomorrow, um, another in our, in, in, our in our webinar lunchtime series, uh, Roger's going to be talking to, it, it's, it's actually the anniversary of the first case of COVID, apparently, and therefore, well, it says to celebrate, I've written here, but it isn't, it's to commemorate. It'll be Tim Spector, he of the app, who will be talking about just how did the virus spread all the way across the country, except to Cornwall or the Isle of Wight. And next week, Cliff Stott, another member of SAGE, will be talking about policing the pandemic. So, back to you, Rachel. Now, when you came on Rachel's Day, as we will call it, and you opened the batting for us in our COVID series, 
Um, I'm going to repeat the, the question that I, the last question I asked you then was this, what do you think COVID will mean for the next generation of doctors who will now be seared in the flames of COVID? And I can change it and say, not what will it mean? What do you think COVID has meant for the next generation of those doctors seared in the flames of COVID? What does it mean? I think that for everybody who stepped up this year, especially the very new, um, inexperienced doctors and nurses or people who were thrust into roles that they had never really been trained for, never imagined they might have to inhabit. Um, I think that more than anything, this year of trauma and fear and grief and distress and and maybe even horror in some ways because it has been horrific this year in many ways um, has taught us all that as individuals and actually as a society as well we perhaps have more resilience than we ever knew possible. That doesn't mean it's been easy. That doesn't mean we're not traumatized. But when the moment came and when we had to step up as little individual doctors, nurses, porters and so on, or collectively as a community, as a country, we did it. We all did it this year. If you think back to March and April, everyone I know tried to do their bit um, everybody stepped up, whether they were setting up a little local COVID group, WhatsApp group in their street to help people who were shielding, or they were a psychiatrist who suddenly found themselves working in ICU for the pandemic. Indeed. You name it, people stepped up. And I find it endlessly wondrous, genuinely wondrous that we all did that. And I think what it means to me, and I suspect it means this to a lot of people, is that fundamentally, when it comes to the crunch, what we learned in 2020 was that people are decent and people are good. And when people have to choose between being selfish and looking after only themselves or reaching out towards other human beings and trying to help other vulnerable human beings, when it really comes to the crunch, we care about each other. And that is an extraordinary lesson to take away from 2020. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much for coming. We didn't get through all the questions, but uh, certainly the moment now they're turning to plaudits led by Peter Carter. So thank you so much for what you've done and also say how much you've enjoyed your book, which I'll once again remind people, get it now before it sells out. And Rachel, thank you for coming on. You were as good as I knew you would be. And um, we'll, I'll hopefully the next time I see you, it will be in person. But thanks, thanks, and thanks on behalf of everyone at the RSM and everyone in the audience. And good night, everybody. See you next time. Thank you.